Here's a whirlwind tour of basic complex analysis. Um, this is based on a uh, just a fun lecture I gave to um, near the end of a multivariable calculus class. Uh, you could get a little out, out of this if you actually only know Calc 1 and Calc 2, but uh, after a point, uh, a lot of it you're not going to uh, make sense of unless you've seen um, some multivariable stuff. Um, it really is going to be quick. I'm going to go over things really quickly. I'm not trying to make it a real course or anything, but it's just such a fun topic, um, and we had fun. So hopefully this will be some fun videos. So um, we've got a function. First idea is a function from the complex plane to the complex plane. So the inputs uh, are like z, some x plus i, y, and then the output is f of z, and it's got a, it's going to have a real part and an imaginary part as well okay um, and sometimes we're going to be able to just get away with not worrying about the real and imaginary parts and sometimes we really got to break it out into those real and imaginary parts in fact there's kind of two perspectives that I realized in preparing this talk that's really it's kind of at the heart of the subject um, there's the algebraic perspective where C the complex numbers is seen as very light, very much like the real numbers, but better. Uh, to use technical language, it's a field, just like R is a field. You can look that up on Wikipedia if you want. Um, but it's a complete, it's an algebraically um, complete field. Um, and then there's the geometric perspective, where C is like the plane, okay, but with more structure. So this is the picture of the complex plane where you take like 1 plus i is a point in the plane. Um, so this is a this is a distinction or this is a, a, a interrelation of these two viewpoints that goes on throughout ev anybody who deals with complex numbers um, that you either think of it as really just sort of an overgrown number line or really take advantage of the fact that it has uh, more geometric structure and and uh, more directions to go in okay and that corresponds to the algebraist would would do this and would very rarely take out the rare, the real and com the imaginary parts, or you know, somewhat rarely. Uh, it's not illegal. The geometric perspective is going to be more likely to look at these separately and take advantage of that. Okay, they're both good. I'm not saying one is bad and one's one's good. Okay, and it's the interrelation that's really, as I said, the heart of the subject. Okay, so um, example f of z equals z squared. Okay. From the algebraic point of view, that's an incredibly natural, simple thing to do. It must be well behaved. From a geometric point of view, it's already pretty interesting and non-trivial to think about it. Okay. From the geometric point of view, we want to be able to draw the picture of a mapping from the plane to the plane. And this is one of those places where you're going to need to have some kind of a multivariable calc intuition. Okay. So we've got x and y on the input, and let's say u and v on the output. And um, to get an idea of what the mapping looks like, we need to write it in terms of x's and y's. That's x plus iy quantity squared. If you foil that out, you get x squared and you get iy quantity squared, which is minus y squared. That is the whole name of the game, of course. i squared is minus 1. And then the cross terms are just i times 2xy. So what I've done is I've named the real and imaginary parts of the input. So to think of it as just a point in the complex plane there. And then I've gotten the real, and I've separated the real and imaginary parts of the output. OK, so then we have to use some knowledge about mapping. Uh, how do you picture maps of the, um, the plane to the plane? One way is to like take a grid of in, in the input and see where each grid line goes on the output. Well, turns out that I've got something that gives a nice picture of that. Um, it's right here. So here's the grid on the input, and it turns out here's the grid on the output, okay? Um, that these straight lines turn into parabolas. Not too surprising, okay? So there's some squaring going on, okay? And notice the red line, for example, goes into this parabola, and all the other uh, vertical lines are going to go to the parabolas that are kind of, that that's in the same family as. And then the blue line, it turns out this goes to a straight line. Well, that's because it's the real axis stays real and, in fact, just goes to the positive real. But if I move the blue line up, which I can do um, like this, then it's going to go to a parabola as well. One interesting thing is that even though uh, the straight lines are getting curved when I look at their, the outputs, the intersection here is still orthogonal. These are still perpendicular, just like these are perpendicular. 
Turns out that's not an accident. That's because of some nice properties of this function when you think about it in, um, in terms of complex numbers. Okay, so that's the kind of one kind of picture we could do. I want to show you real quick another kind of picture we could do. Um, there's lots of ways to picture mappings, especially from the complex plane to itself. Actually, two, two more pictures real quick. This is another kind of picture we could make. Um, it's a kind of cool way to put everything on one picture. What this does is it only looks at the domain of the, uh, of the function, and then each point it colors depending on what kind of properties the output point has. So f of z, z is the location of the point, and f of z dis um, is, is controlling the color. Um, what happens is um, you start with just a color wheel like this in the complex plane so that as you go around the, the shade uh, continuously changes and one of the nice things about human visual perception is it kind of feels like a wheel, kind of something that goes around a circle. And then the, um, you use uh, like a darkness, lightness, or a saturation parameter to describe how far you are away from the origin. So what I do in this kind of picture is for each point I calculate f of z and then I color it and shade it according to where it ends up in the complex plane. So we get funky uh, shapes like this where if we go around we go yellow, red, blue, then back to yellow and then back to red, blue, and so it cycles twice as I go around. That's an interesting feature you can see pretty easily in the picture. I won't talk about it too much more but if you want to look at it one of the Wikipedia articles is called Domain Coloring and if you just uh, like go from there and click around or uh, do a, a search then you'll find some interesting stuff. Then there's another kind of cool thing where you look at a picture, you put a picture on the complex plane and then you let the mapping distort that and so it becomes funky pictures like this. Yeah, again you can see these, um, uh, these curves, this is actually the squaring map again. Um, it's, pretty, it's pretty fun. You can click around this guy. This is the article name is Conformal Pictures. It's pretty cool. Okay, but back to um, back to doing things by hand. So already the geometric point of view uh, is interesting, or we could even say complicated. Okay, um, and the nice thing is we're not going to need to know too much about that, but it it really is in the background of a lot of what's going on is these mappings. Okay, um, so that's what the idea of a complex function. Okay, um, I don't want to go too long on this one, but let's introduce the idea of the complex derivative. Okay, um, so in real variables, f prime of x is defined to be the limit as h goes to zero. I wiggle the input in all the ways I can, plus and minus. And I see what happens to the output when I wiggle. I compare it to what I had without wiggling. And then I look at the rate of change, how much it changed compared to how much I changed the input. Okay. Alrighty. So, um, and as I said, it's important that here, this is not just x go, h goes to 0 plus or 0 minus. And if we have like a function like this, where the slope on the left-hand side is different from the slope on the right-hand side, we do not say that's differentiable. That's not, does not satisfy almost any of the good properties that we get from differentiability. Okay, so that's not allowed. All right, and th th that might seem like, oh yeah, I knew that a long time ago if you're familiar with calculus. Okay, well, in the complex plane, the great thing is the definition is exactly the same. I'm just going to change the letters to emphasize that everything's a complex number. I'm going to call this little extra thing, the wi extra wiggle, W, and Z, these are traditional letters, by the way, for complex numbers is going to be the point at which we're taking the derivative. Okay, It's exactly the same uh, expression. It turns out though that it has some, not all, very different properties. Definitely a lot of the properties are overlapping. But there's, there's more, this is a more restrictive thing to say about this, if this limit exists. And it's basically because what we've got is we've got, now we've got, you know, in, in uh, the input domain here, that's our function, that's our point z. We're saying that when we take this limit, we can come in in any direction, or we can wiggle along any line. If we wiggle and we let w be along this line, or this line, or this line, or this line, any direction, infinite number of directions, I've got to keep getting the same exact limit when I calculate this expression. That's a little bit analogous to the fact that this guy wasn't allowed. 
that plus and minus derivatives should be the same. But it's much more powerful, because instead of two things being equal, it's an infinity of different numbers in all these infinitely different directions required to be the same. So it turns out that that's a very, very strong assumption, and it gives some unexpected results, unexpected consequences, if we're just used to the idea of differentiability for a real function. However, uh, first of all, let's go back to the, um, that's, it's kind of, and again, this is exactly that interaction between algebra and, and geometry. The algebra is the same definition exactly. And I'm about to show um, that if you do an, an algebraically defined function, then you can't even notice the difference between the proof. Uh, so f prime of z is just going to be the limit as w goes to 0 of, uh, well, let me just write it out, z plus w squared minus z squared over w. Okay? We're not even going to notice the difference if you look, compare this to a proof in a just Calc 1 book of finding the derivative of this and proving the derivative exists. We just FOIL this out. Why is this possible? It's because complex numbers satisfy every single form, uh, fundamental rule of real numbers. It's a field. It satisfies all the field axioms, in addition to having funky things like i squared equals minus 1. OK. So the z squareds cancel. The w cancels. And then I get 2z plus w, but I'm taking the limit as w goes to 0. And I get, oops, I'm really done, 2z. It's the usual formula, OK? So similarly, um, the derivative d by dz, same notation, of z to the k, limit w goes to 0 of z plus w to the k minus z to the k over w. OK, Let's see how that works out. So here with the algebra, it's not going to look very, very different. So let's see, I'm going to use the um, uh, binomial theorem to expand that out. I get k w z to the k minus 1 plus a bunch of stuff. Um, it's all going to have w squared or above in it. And I'm going to denote that by saying o, big O of w squared. That means it's the order of w squared. And in this context, that means it's w squared, w cubed, et cetera, higher powers. It's a very handy notation. OK, uh, that's a minus, of course. That's going to help. The zk's cancel. Then the w cancels here, and then it turns that into something that at least has a w in it, just like this guy. OK, and then I take the limit as w goes to 0. Oh, that dies. Oh, get, guess what? Same exact thing. Really nothing different. Kind of boring. OK, so when I've got things defined by algebra, it's looking like nothing is really new. OK. Um, and that's cool, OK? That's a good thing. And in fact, you can show, I'm not going to prove it, that the usual rules for sums and differences and products and quotients all work. Crucially, the chain rule works. Because basically, these are just based on the algebraic properties of the formula for the derivative, the difference quotient, and a little bit about limits working in a, but in a very benign way, not, not anything about um, essential about different limits in different directions. Okay, um, And in fact, let me go a little further. So this immediately tells us that polynomials are going to be differentiable. Uh, that shouldn't shock you. It's like, what kind of theory would it be if, if like, uh, um, you know, z cubed plus z squared minus 7z plus 14. If that weren't differentiable, it would be pretty weak, OK? Um, but let me take it a little further. Power series, as long as they're convergent, and that's always an issue with power series, those are going to be differentiable as well, because they're basically just overgrown polynomials. You'd have to a little bit more work there to be careful about basically differentiating a power series term by term and making sure that the complex numbers don't screw up in that way. But they don't, OK? So turns out that power series are an incredibly important tool in complex analysis, even more so than in real analysis. And they're really, really powerful there as well, OK? Now, so that's the good news about derivatives. 
um, that for algebraically defined things and even with power series, they work exactly as you'd expect. Okay. Uh, but in the next video, what I'll start out with, out with is talking about what I've been alluding to already, the weirdness of um, this notion of derivative because of the idea of different directions.